Hello everyone, this is Noah and John and we are from Urban Digs and today we are talking Manhattan and we're going into the banking world, Johnny, for the next couple of podcasts, the lending world. Yes, and that's a, uh, an, an exceedingly important component, especially with everything that's going on. So I'm looking forward to today's guest, uh, Adam Turkowitz. And a quick changing one. It's a quick changing yeah, environment. Yeah, that's right the now. thing. It's like a day by day kind of thing, and I think Adam's going to lead us down the path of, of multi paths kind of thing. Just one he'll lead us. Thing. He'll lead us somewhere. He'll definitely lead us somewhere, and it'll probably be a really cool area. Um, I mean, we did that. We did the attorney thing. We did the attorney thing for like two weeks, John, and we and we wanted to see where the deals are because they're in the front line. So I think wrapping it up with the lender thing um, is the way to go. Yeah, because now, so now you're talking about front lines, but you're also talking about risk management. You're talking about looking down the curve a little bit. So this is going to be an interesting discussion. I love it. Um, and it's yeah. going to have advice for right now as well as in the future. So let's, uh, let's jump into it. Yeah. Adam Turkowitz, mortgage professional specializing in New York City for the last 16 years. Thank you so much for joining us, Adam. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Hey, Adam, what, what high level? What's, um, let's just start out. What's going on out there? What are you seeing? And uh, tell us what's going on. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we're in a, a rapidly changing environment right now in the mortgage business. Um, you know, credit policy is adapting with the current environment that we're in. Um, you know, much like we saw after the recession of 2008, you know, banks are trying to acclimate themselves to the current risk environment that we find ourselves in. Um, and so you're finding yourself in a, in, in, a, in a time of change, right? And, you know, who's ever able to adapt to that change, you know, best is really going to come out of this, uh, you know, the winner. Right. So, I mean, so, so what do buyers need to know in terms of change? I mean, I know you're, you're talking about there's, there's credit contraction because that's what happened in 2008, 2009 is banks just did not want to lend and they were not in a position to lend because they knew that their books were about to get all messed up with the write downs. So um, is it similar in the sense that we have bank write downs coming up and they're contracting because they just do not want to lend in a deflationary environment to a, a rising unemployment environment? Or is there something deeper going on here? So I think banks want to lend. Um, I think they just have to adapt their credit policy to the environment that we find ourselves in today. So in an environment where we see unemployment rates rising, in an environment where we can predict that home valuations may decline, like they did coming out of 08, we're still here to lend money. We just mm -hmm. have to adapt our credit policy and change our credit policy uh, to fit the current world that, we cur that we're in right now. And, and for the buyer, that, that equates to more down payment. So typically it's going to, it's going to equate some more down payment. You know, it's going to look uh, a little bit more scrupulous in terms of underwriting the buyer, you know, especially the buyer that is dependent on that discretionary type of earning, right? Uh, commission, right. overtime or salary uh, or bonus rather, uh, rental income, self-employment income. So those types of incomes, you know, underwriting is really going to want to look at and make sure that the continuance of that income is going to be there and sustain you know, through not only this environment that we're in right now, but when we come out of this environment. And there are many businesses that are out there right now that are actually doing well, you know, such as, uh, you know, those that, that deal with, you know, uh, home technology and, 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 you know, Zooms like we're on right now. Right. Um, what about, how do you guys handle furloughs? So somebody that is currently furloughed, you know, they're not currently making any income. I mean, they're still technically employed by the company, but they don't have income coming in. You know, unfortunately, with a furlough situation, you know, it, it's hard to lend to that person because we're not able to provide what's called the ability to repay, you know, without the income coming in, uh, we, we can't show the customer right. to repay the bank, which is a requirement. Right. Right. Got you. Um, let me ask you a question. This is something that's been on my mind, Adam, and I'm curious about. Um, I know on the legal side, um, a lot of agents were talking about existing legacy deals, deals that, that were um, signed into contract before Corona um, and may or may not close or, or being renegotiated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I know you're on the lending side. There's no renegotiation, but are you seeing or hearing of, of legacy existing deals that just are not closing anymore? So what I'm seeing is, you know, deals that have gone into contract since the corona, I'm actually seeing contingencies uh, being negotiated that I've never seen before in the New York market, you know, such as contingencies taking you all the way through funding. Um, I'm seeing these a lot more so in some of the new developments where uh, their pre-sale numbers may be a little bit on the lower side and the developers are trying to get their pre-sale numbers up. They're starting to be a little bit uh, looser in terms of the contingencies they're providing for buyers to incentivize them to go to contract, make them feel more comfortable to go to contract. In terms of customers that are currently in contract and they were in contract prior to COVID-19, 
Um, you know, we haven't really seen much in the in the sense of negotiations post uh, COVID nineteen because they're in contract. You know, their their terms uh, prevail. Um, now they may not have the ability to obtain financing any longer, and, and that would really be up to the attorneys to figure out how to work the deal from there. But right. for the most part, we really haven't seen that happen. Right. And and speaking of that, I just want to touch on um, on those rates. What are we looking at in terms of rates? I mean. It, what's the spread look like between the the lower price properties, the upper price, you know, the jumbo and the non jumbos, sure. and it just I'm just curious what's happening there. So, so some interesting st- uh, numbers to go over, right? So, you know, two silos that we really talk about when we talk about interest rates. We talk about you know non conforming or jumbo rates, and then we talk about conforming or you know, loans that get sold off of Fannie Mae. So, you know, being that we're in New York City, let's let's focus a little bit more of the time on the jumbo, uh, just given our average purchase prices and average uh, size of loans. Uh, currently, right now, you know, someone buying a, a home financing a million dollars, 20% down, good credit, they're looking at a 30-year fixed rate at 3.125% with an APR of 3.201%. Interest rates are really, really low. And, and that's, that's the rate without any relationship pricing, just the market rate coming off the street um, for a jumbo loan. So rates are really, really good. If you wanted to back up a little bit and take a look at, well, you know, where were rates you know, back in uh, the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, right? 10-year Treasury was at you know in November of 2018. Remember, we had a 10-year Treasury at around 3.24 percent. Today, we're at about 0.61 percent. So, if you go back to that time frame, and you just said, "Hey, interest rates were an entire percentage points or more higher," um, you know, you were looking on a million-dollar mortgage, a difference in payment of about $563 a month. So that's pretty considerable. It's about 10% of the payment, a little bit more than 10% of the payment. So if you had a customer back at the end of 2018 that was looking to buy a home and was going into it with the assumption of an interest rate of around four and eighth percent with an APR of, of 4.2%, you've got somebody today maintaining that same payment that's able to finance about 11 to 12% more maintaining that same level of payment. So on the portfolio side, rates are really, really low right now. It's a great time to finance. Uh, hey. Sorry, Adam, go ahead. On the other side, you know, on the conforming side where you have, you know, the smaller loans, uh, the Fannie Mae loans, the loans that banks are selling off to the agencies, again, still a very low rate environment. Uh, today, the 30-year fixed rate on a purchase for $400,000 uh, loan, you know, 80% financing, you know, you're looking at a 30-year fixed rate at 3.375%, APR 3.454%. Uh, again, you're seeing the same thing though. If you backed up, you know, an entire percentage point uh, about a year and change, uh, you know, earlier in the year, um, where rates were about four and eight, four and three eighths percent, uh, you know, you're seeing a difference in payment of about two hundred and thirty dollars a month. So, you know, again, a very affordable time in terms of you know, monthly payment for the buyer. Hey, hey, Adam, um, you know, you were getting my brain going right in the middle of that. So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But um, in the last couple of months, like pre-corona. Right. So like where rates were in February, let's call it, or even January, I don't care. Um, we didn't really move down much. We haven't. So what, what we found is, you know, there, there's been a disconnect in the market. So traditionally people in the market that, that are focusing on mortgages really look at a 10 year treasury to kind of dictate where rates going to go. Kind of what we found is, is really the 10 year treasury is more of a guidepost than anything else. Right. We're not pricing our loans based on the spread above the 10 year treasury but more so looking at the 10-year treasury to determine have rates moved down, have rates moved up. The problem that you start to run into when rates hit the levels that they're at, you know, really two things. One, you really can't compare the risk of a, of a mortgage bond to that of a U.S. treasury, right? U.S. Right. treasuries have effectively no prepayment risk and no default risk. Right. Well, right. right. mortgage bond, mortgage bonds have prepayment risk, right? People refinancing, people paying off their homes, selling their homes, and they have uh, they have default risk, right? And we're kind right. of working through that right now. We've gone through some of that over the last decade. Um, you know, and then the other thing you had is when rates move down as fast as they move down, you have a huge surge into the market. And so you start having capacity constraints at the banks as well. So I think yeah, it's kind of a mixture of, we're not really pricing a margin above treasury, but we also have capacity, right? There's only so many underwriters, there's only so many hours in a, in a day, and we can only underwrite so many loans in a given week. Right. Yeah. And I, and I love this kind of discussions right here. I mean, so, so, so the bottom line is, is mortgages are, mortgages are priced off of um, uh, mortgage bonds, not, not treasuries. We use treasury as a, as a, as a guide because the consumer understands treasuries more, right, than mortgage bonds. Um, and that the prepayment risk and the default risk is, is the separator here and why 
those rates weren't falling as the 10 year treasury really got clobbered and uh, I'm sorry, was, was rallying and, and rates went down um, in the last couple of months during this crisis. Is that, is that a correct assumption? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different factors that go into it, right? Those are just some of them. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, banks still also have to make a profit, right? You still have to money on the loan. So there's a lot of different factors that go into it. You know, there's just the cost of just manufacturing. Right. Hey, uh, quick question. Negative rates? You see negative rates coming to the States? Or is that just they're not going to allow that to happen? No, I, I, I don't know the, uh, the answer to that. Um, you know, when, when interest rates were at 5%, I never thought that they would go below 4%. When they were at four percent, right. I never thought they would be looking at a thirty-year fixed rate, almost at three percent. So right? Is it possible? You know, I, I guess what I've learned over the last uh, last year or so, and, and really over the last uh, sixteen years, is never discount anything. But um, I, I don't, I don't think we're going to see negative rates. I mean, with, with in the era of modern monetary theory, I wouldn't be surprised about anything. Hey, John, you know, you've been quiet back there. I want to, I want to hear you for a second. Give Adam a, a chance to catch his breath for a minute. What do you think about negative rates, John? Well, frankly, I don't want Adam to catch his breath. I just want him to keep going because <laughs> I know that. But for a second, like, what awesome. do you think about negative rates? Ah, uh, I wish I had something intelligent to say about negative rates. I, I get the feeling that they could be inevitable, just given the global climate right now. Yeah. Um, but I don't know how it would play out. Uh, and, and what kind of brings me to my next question, which is. I mean, look, with rates so low, I imagine the risk that the banks are running on these, on these loans is probably increasing step by step. I know they're probably trying to tighten down lending standards to kind of mitigate some of that risk. But at the end of the day, I mean, the, the marginal spread, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the spread is sort of maintained no matter where rates are. But I would think as rates get really super low, like, I mean, really, the, the margin for error is less and less and less as rates go lower. Or is that, is that the case? And the other question is, I mean, listen, if you're an agent right there, what, what would your advice to agents be to kind of prepare their clients for trying to get a loan in this environment? So, you know, I think first of all, you've got to be careful what you wish for, right? So, you know, if, if rates go negative, you know, why did they go negative, right? Think about right. Like, yeah. the overall global economy and our domestic economy. So, you know, kind of careful what you wish for. I don't necessarily, you know, wish for negative rates because I think we all understand what that meant for just the overall economy in general. Right. Uh, in terms of, you know, what I can, the best advice I can give to agents and, uh, and their buyers and agents that are also representing their sellers is make sure that the buyer coming in is qualified, right? And, and more so than just qualified, but actually approved, right? That they've actually gone through the application process. Their credit has been checked. The client has provided all their income and asset statements, and it's been vetted by the bank, right? The strongest thing you can do, and this was the advice, quite frankly, that we gave a lot of our customers, even pre-COVID-19 was make sure your buyers are vetted by the bank, that their income has been vetted. You remember, you know, we work in a, in a marketplace where it's not just a W-2, it's not just a base salary. There are other factors that go into our customers' compensation, such as bonuses, restricted stock, um, you know, all different types of distributions and other types of incomes that are very unique to some of the more complex markets around the country. So it's very important that we understand, you know, a customer that may have received a bonus of, of a half a million dollars last year and receive a bonus of $200,000 the year before, mm -hmm. banks aren't just gonna use the most recent higher amount. We're also gonna to wanna to understand, well, how is what's going on right now gonna impact that continuance of the income next year when bonuses pay out? Is it likely that bonuses will pay out next year? Remember, coming out of 2008, one of the things that we saw were cash bonuses almost didn't exist for some customers, right? Their bonuses were paid in the form of restricted stock that would invest over a three to five year period. So these are some of the things that as we're talking to our customers up front, we're trying to understand, you know, it, it, are you expecting to receive a bonus, right? If you have a customer that is a portfolio manager, um, the portfolio is probably down, right? The likelihood of a bonus or, or a bonus that matches what they received last year, it's probably low. Right. So, yeah. How, yeah, so how reliant are we on that form of income to qualify that buyer, you know, to that? So let me ask, it sounds like the, the underwriting standards are constantly evolving. And this is the fact that we're in a new environment doesn't mean that the standards kind of went from, you know, zero to one in terms of change. They've, it sounds like they've been constantly changing and they were adapting pretty much every year. And I'm curious, I, my guess, is it sounds like they're a lot stricter now. And it looks like they're, they're looking at not just what your income is now, but what it might be in six to nine months based on, you know, if your portfolio manager is your portfolio down, you're probably not going to get a bonus come January, February. So let's, let's take that into account. Do you think these things are going to stick or is, is tighter lending in terms of restrictions and, and um, maybe not restrictions, but just in terms of the overall uh, sort of 
grade on underwriting? Is that going to stick around for a long time? Yeah. So I think what you're going to find is, you, you know, you're going to find yourself as the credit environment, you know, evolves, you know, you're going to see expansions and you're going to see contractions and you're going to see that as, you know, our, our, our credit folks, you know, over in corporate credit, and, you know, amongst the industry, you know, as you start to, as they start to uh, uh, evaluate, you know, how bad are things really getting, you know, maybe they could be a little bit more surgical with, um, with the, with, with the credit policies that they're putting out, right? Maybe, you know, New York is, is rebounding much better than other parts of the country. You know? So we don't know what's going to happen yet, but we do know that, you know, credit will evolve, you know, policies will evolve and they'll evolve to reflect the current state that we're in, but also to try and project out where they see the current market going. Right. Hey, Adam, uh, pre-qualification versus pre-approval. You mentioned it before. Um, the pre-approval, that's, that's the one you really want, right? Yeah, that's the one that's got the substance, the meat and potatoes to it. So, you know, a pre-qualification for all intents and purposes really just means that somebody has uh, filled out an application, the, uh, they've, they've had their credit pulled, um, but based on the information they provided, you know, and it scrubs up against some sort of an algorithm at the bank's credit policy, the system comes back and says, hey, you're qualified. Based on what you've told us, nothing's been verified yet in terms of documentation. No underwriter has reviewed it. So that's a pre-qualification. Really what we strive for with our buyers is to go through that full pre-approval process. So, you know, applications completed, uh, the credit report has been pulled, we've collected all their income, their assets, their credit documents, and we've submitted it to the underwriting team. A pre-qualification is really done in about 24 hours. I mean, that's done, you know, almost instantaneously. Right. Approval, you know, it, it's, 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 a, it's a process, you know, that could take a week and a half just to get through the underwriting process uh, to make sure that the, the customer is approved. Um, and then typically that will come out of the underwriting process with, you know, some conditions, right? You know, appraisal, contract, title, insurance. If you've done our, our job the right way, um, it's really all to come out with is minimal conditions. Both of them are free. So they don't cost any money. There's no money to, right. to, to get approved. There's no money to get pre-qualified. Um, you know, it's a free process. Really what you're doing is you have to invest the time. You have to invest the time to collect all the documents and go back and forth with the lender to get through the approval process. Yeah. And, and I guess you got to um, um, convince the, the client, the buyer that, that the, the, the in-depth process is, is better for them. Because I mean, if they go through that process and they get the approval, I, I imagine that approval is good for, uh, I guess, a couple of weeks at least. But if they're in the process of bidding, and this is the point, this is what agents need to understand is that if you got buyers out there and those buyers are, are bidding 15, 20, 25% down in today's market, which they probably are, are thinking about or are doing, um, it's a dislocated market. But you know, if you present that pre-approval and you explain the difference and the seller understands there is a difference between pre-approval and pre-qualification and you are bidding down 15, 20%, it's going to help. Yeah. I mean, we, we really try to educate our buyers, you know, you know, upfront, you know, we try to explain to them that, you know, the buyers that are in the market today are very serious, right? They're in the market. They want to buy something. The sellers that are in the market today, they're very serious. They want yeah. something. So we're in a market right now that's, you know, if you're in it, it's a pretty competitive market, right? So deals are transacting, um, but you also have the cash buyers that are coming in as well. And so if you're going in to uh, put an offering, you've got to really paint yourself in the right light. And, and by telling the seller and telling the brokers, Hey, I've, I've, I've sent all my documentation into the bank. They've already reviewed everything. And, and here's my approval. And here's a list of conditions that the bank needs in order to satisfy the loan. That makes the seller feel much com more comfortable, but also it makes the buyer feel more comfortable in moving forward in the transaction. Right. Yeah. That's fantastic stuff. Hey, listen, Adam, um, we're getting towards the end here, but uh, I mean, John, I don't know if you have any questions to, to ask Adam after this, but um, are you seeing any, I mean, I know you've probably seen destruction in terms of activity for the last five, six weeks. Um, I'm sure you're seeing refis. I'm more interested in purchase applications. Are you seeing any bottoming stabilization in terms of the drop or decline in purchase applications? Or, or dare I ask, are you seeing any tick up in activity? <laughs> so, um, you know, we came into 2020 uh, you know, with, with really, really, with a lot of activity going on, there were a lot of purchase applications coming in. In fact, um, you know, personally, I was sitting on one of my largest pre pipelines, you know, that I've ever had in the last 16 years, which is a good indicator of, of what's to come, right? The pre-approval pipeline is those that are out there looking in the market. Uh, fast forward a few months into 2020, we ran into COVID-19. Um, and, you know, April was one of the worst uh, months that we've had in terms of applications coming in for, for purchase transactions. Um, but we're starting to see that turn. We're starting to see uh, things turn around a little bit. 
And, uh, you know, last week was a pretty decent week. I, I wouldn't say it was an excellent week in terms of applications, but it was up from, you know, where we were uh, over the weekend. Uh, you know, I had a lot of activity coming in of, of, you know, people that were looking to put an offer in on the property or people that were looking to start the approval process. So, you know, there's a little bit of light at the end of the, the tunnel. You know, what I tell myself and what I tell a lot of the, the bankers that, that I work with, you know, is you got to remember, you know, you, you got to look back at prior historical points, right? Look at what happened with New York coming out of, uh, you know, some unfortunate times, right? September 11th. Yeah. Look at what happened coming out of 2008. You know, New York City is not immune to, you know, um, to impacts from certain things. But what you find is New York City is a very resilient market and it right. tends to rebound much quicker than a lot of other places around the country. Right. And you mentioned uh, in the last previous segment, we, we, you'd mentioned briefly appraisals and that's sort of part of the process. And I'm curious what you're seeing in terms of appraisals. And, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is just, you mentioned that, I mean, the market have been somewhat on a rebound. So some of these, the, the appraisals have been coming in uh, really good. And I'm curious at some point they might start turning around and I'm seeing, I'm curious what you're seeing in appraisals uh, where the values are coming in uh, and any advice you have for agents regarding uh, appraisals and comps. Great question. Thanks, John. Yeah, good question. Um, so, so, you know, remember an appraisal is, uh, is a document that's based on historical data, right? What has sold, not what is selling, not what they project to sell, but what has sold. So if you look back at what has sold and you look at the last three to six months, there's a lot of data to look at, right? Fast forward into the summer months, right? July and August, there's not a lot of activity that's happening right now. So the data that's available to the appraisers to use to, to appraise their properties it's not as robust. They may have to go back a little bit in time and then maybe adjust with time. Um, or, or, and, and so right now we haven't really seen many appraisals come in low and the appraisals that we've seen come in low were those that were signed where there may have been a little bit of a bidding war and the buyer knew going into contract that that apartment may not appraise or may not appraise at value there. And they were coming in significantly off. Where I have a little bit more concern is, again, when you, when you fast forward a few months from now and you have the lack of data, right, the lack of, uh, of, of, of homes that have sold uh, that are now part of public record, that's where you may have a little bit more problem, you know, uh, in terms of finding the value. Gotcha. This has been great. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, your wisdom is amazing. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, my audience greatly appreciates Adam Terkowitz, uh, mortgage professional for the last 16 years in New York City. Um, thank you so much for spending the time with us. Um, we're definitely going to hopefully have you back maybe in a couple of months. I hope that would be okay with you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Great. Thanks, Adam. This is Noah and John. Of course, we are from Urban Digs. And of course, we're talking Manhattan, especially during these times. I hope you enjoyed it and we'll catch you next time.